Wow, and just like that, we have chicken breast that does not suck. Hi, I'm Sola, and we're at the New York Times Cooking Studio, and today I'm gonna teach you the basics about chicken. I'm gonna teach you a few simple ways to prepare chicken so that you can like go forth confidently and become a poultry master. We're gonna start off with a really simple whole chicken. I'm gonna show you how to spatchcock so you can cook it really evenly. A quick recipe with the breast that does not suck, that is not dry. And a really simple braising technique for some chicken thighs and chicken drums. Three really distinct chicken techniques that you can translate to a lot of other dishes. Oh, and then there'll be a bonus round of what to do with your leftover bones and meat. Chicken. Wow. When you go to the store to buy chicken, what's great is you can get a whole chicken or you can get any part of chicken you could ever imagine. I like to always go for a whole chicken and break it down myself. But when you're starting off, that can feel like a lot. But don't worry, they've done all the work for you. If you can get an organic pasture-raised chicken, I think you should. And if you can level up to heritage, I personally think they're more flavorful, but it is a very big difference in price. So it's up to you. Otherwise, it's good to pick a part. They've done a lot of the work for you, so all you gotta do is pat dry and cook. Oftentimes, you can even find a chicken that's already been spatchcocked for you. So easy. I'm gonna show you how to do this, so you can have the backbone for nibbling on, for stock, but if, you, if, it, if it intimidates you, you can still have a spatchcock chicken. Let someone else do the work for you. I have a chicken PSA. Please, please, Please stop washing your chicken. Please head over to the USDA's website or the FDA or uh, the CDC or every single state health department. Every university has a study on this. Washing your chicken is the worst thing you can do for cross-contamination. I know in your mind you're like, oh, that the chicken juices are all in the sink, but it's not true. There's been like several studies done, black light tests. When you wash your chicken, you're spreading that bacteria like up to 10 feet in all directions. And most importantly, when you wash your chicken, you make it waterlogged, so it becomes really hard to get it brown and delicious. The only way to eliminate bacteria and prevent salmonella is thorough cooking of your protein. So stop doing it, end the generational chicken trauma here. Okay, so we're gonna kick things off with the spatchcock chicken. I know that sounds difficult, but I think it is like the easiest way to cook a chicken. But before we get started, chicken, cross-contamination, salmonella, right? So we have to talk about that a little bit. Whenever you're cooking with chicken, I think it's important to get all the stuff you need before you start touching the chicken. So I'm gonna get my scissors, keep them handy so I'm not digging around in a drawer with chicken hands. And I'm gonna mix up my salt and pepper, which is gonna be for my dry brine, because I don't want to like, with chicken hands, you know? For the dry brine, I'm gonna just do simple salt and pepper. Prepare more than you think you're gonna need, because you wanna have enough seasoning to work with. So I'm all set up, I got everything close by, I can touch my chicken. So I'm using a wooden cutting board. A research has shown that wood actually has natural antibacterial properties. So when you cut chicken on wood, and you scrub it down, if there is any bacteria left on the surface, there's through like the capillary action, the bacteria gets sucked into the wood where it starves and dies. When you cut on plastic, as you use your board for a while, you develop these like grooves in it, you know, from cutting repeatedly. The bacteria can still live deep within those grooves and grow and become gross. On the chicken, it's not just one mass of meat, there's a lot going on. So we've got our active muscles, the legs, because they do all the walking, the wings, and the active muscles have a lot of connective tissue and they have more fat. So they can handle cooking for like a long time. And they actually do better when they get cooked to a higher temp than the required 165, because it allows all the like collagen that develops when the chicken runs around to render. The breast on the other hand, it's very lean and it's very delicate and it needs to just be cooked through. For like the perfect chicken breast, you do not want to cook it at a touch over 165. And spatchcocking makes it easier for us to get those two temperatures in one bird. Let's take a peek. Make sure there's nothing in there. She's empty. One time, I roasted a duck, and I thought I took out the giblet bag, and I did. And then there were two more giblet bags in there. 
Okay, so we're going to flip it over. So this is the backbone, and we're going to snip along the sides. So the backbone itself is pretty thick and tough to cut through, but it's connected to the chicken with really thin rib bones. So it's pretty easy to snip through those bones. Get a good pair of kitchen shears, and if you don't have kitchen shears, you can do this with a knife, but in that case, you would have to stand it up and very gently go one rib bone at a time. It's totally doable, but it's just a little bit harder, and there's like a little bit of danger involved. Here's the tail. You're gonna snip along this side and along that side. And then, you know, just snip one rib at a time. No big deal. Take your time. You don't need to rush. If you don't want to fully remove the backbone, you can just keep it attached and roast it like that. Or take it to the next level. Cut down the other side so you can pull it out. So you can see here, I cut through the ribs. We're gonna do that on this side. Wow, you're a butcher now. Boom. Okay, now we're gonna open this up and flip it over. I like to have the breast towards me. And we're gonna crack the breast just to flatten it a little. So right here, we've got our wishbone. Some people actually take that out. And to do that, you take a little knife and like carve along here and pull it out. But you don't have to. You can also just press and crack it open. There you go. Wow, you did it. You spatchcocked the chicken. I really love wings. They're my favorite part of the chicken. And I love it when the skin gets really rendered and crispy. So just to make sure that happens, this little flap right here, just cut that open and it just allows the heat to better get to the middle so you have better rendering. But you know, that's just like totally optional. It's just because I have a wing thing. It's my favorite part. And ham doesn't like wings, so I get to eat both. That's it. We've got our spatchcock chicken and we have our backbone. Think of this as like a chicken rib. You can gnaw on it or you could save it in a bag in the freezer. When you have a bunch of them, make some stock. The next step, we're gonna dry off our chicken. Moisture is the enemy of brown. If we don't take a minute to like make sure our chicken is really nice and dry, it's gonna go into the oven and steam. This is one place where single-use paper towels belong. Really get in there. And we're gonna dry the other side too. You don't want all of this on the side you just cleaned up, so give it a pat. So we're gonna go the dry brine journey. It's just gonna be like a little more perfect, right? You're gonna have a little bit better color, texture, seasoned all the way through. So I'm not gonna oil it up and I'm gonna season it up. Dry brine, super simple. Just like spatchcocking, it sounds a lot scarier than it actually is. But all we're gonna do is cover it in salt. So I like to start with underneath. It's really important, even sprinkle on every nook and cranny because you want all of this to taste good. Now this looks like a lot of salt, but I am using diamond crystal kosher salt. I like this salt because it's very forgiving. You can like go pretty hard and it's not gonna be salty, but if you have a Morton's kosher, you're gonna do a much lighter distribution of salt. If you have fine sea salt, I really don't recommend it for dry brining just because it's pretty hard to sprinkle evenly. It's so fine, it tends to clump. You gotta take care of those folds. You know, open this flap, hit this with salt. Any part that doesn't have salt, it's not gonna dry brine and it's not gonna render. So every single flap, get in all the nooks and crannies, like this little fold, get under there. It's just like when I'm wiping the folds of my bulldog. <laughs> Take your time. So we're gonna get into those armpits. See, wow, whoa. Every nook and cranny. So this is why you wanna start with more salt than you need. Sprinkle from, from high so it's really nice and even. And then yeah, you're gonna have to toss out this chickeny salt afterwards, but it's okay. It's just, it's just a little bit of salt, no big deal. This is gonna go onto a sheet tray lined with a rack. The rack is really, really important. It lifts up the chicken so it doesn't sit in its own juices. As soon as this chicken gets like a moment to hang out with the salt, Moisture is going to be drawn out and it's going to get very wet. And we don't want it to just sit in that. The rack allows there to be like airflow around the whole chicken so we can get like nice drying happening. I like to leave my wings spread open so that those armpits can get a little air. Some people like to fold it up because it looks a little cuter, but I'm not here for a cute chicken. I'm here for a tasty chicken, right? So we're going to let this hang out in the fridge uncovered. You can really vary how long you dry brine. For a whole chicken like this, Minimum six hours. I think it's ideal after 24. You can take it up to 36. We dry brined a chicken um, about like six hours ago, just to show you a little bit of the difference. We wanna make sure that your chicken looks dry on the outside. That means 
that it's had enough time for the salt to do its thing, to penetrate, the air has flown around, and you can see the color looks a little different. Okay, you can put any kind of aromatic under here. So basically what we want is we want some really flavorful stuff underneath the chicken to kind of steam, keep the meat underneath really nice and moist, and also like infuse it with aroma. So I'm gonna use some scallions, and you don't have to prep it in any special way. Wow. So we're gonna lift this guy up, and we're gonna lay down some scallions. I've got some parsley. This is a good place if you have just like random herb stems, use it here. I've got some onions, I'm gonna use a little lemon. I think any kind of citrus would be really nice. This is a great opportunity to use whatever's looking sad in your fridge, and you can also just get really creative here. We just want something to bring a little moisture and a little flavor to the party. We're gonna think about what fat we wanna coat on here. I don't like to do this with whole butter because the milk solids and the butter can burn. Any other fat really does work. So I'm gonna use some ghee, drizzle it on, and then we're gonna massage it. Make sure you get every nook and cranny. At this point, the salt has penetrated the chicken, so you don't have to worry about it rubbing off. Every bit that has some fat on it is gonna get nice and brown. Our chicken is finally ready for the oven. We're gonna roast this at 450 all the way. Because we spatchcocked, it can really take the high heat. The breast is not gonna like completely dry out on us because it's at a lower position and the, the dark meat's gonna really get that attention. Um, we're also going to put this chicken into the oven legs first. The back of the oven tends to be a little bit hotter, so that's gonna also help us ensure that the dark meat gets a little more heat and the white meat gets a little less. Wow, look at that. That's a beautiful chicken. So, let's talk about how we know it's done. The most accurate, efficient way is to get one of these guys and poke around. When you're cooking a large piece of meat like this, it's gonna continue cooking after it's out of the oven. So it's gonna carry over about 10 degrees. If it's 165 out of the oven, it might be a little bit over after it rests. The dark meat, ideally, you want it to be a little bit higher temp. Like in a perfect world, your dark meat's gonna be like 175 and your white meat's gonna be 155. That's like the perfect, perfect texture for both meats. Spatchcock can allow that to magically happen. Since we dry brine this chicken, it's gonna be moist and juicy up to like 175. I swear, I promise. Try the joint and then here we're reading at like 178, nice. I will go for a few more locations. Wow, fantastic. Just keep poking, try a few different spots. Okay, if you don't have a thermometer, no problem. Pick up a wing. It should be like wiggly. See how that just wants to rip right off? That's perfect. That's what you want. Pick up a drum. It feels like loose, wiggly. That's how you know that the connective tissue is broken down. Take it to the next level. Pierce between the breast and the thigh. Juices are running clear. Everybody's loosey-goosey. We're good to go. So now we're gonna let this rest. I would rest it for at least 15 minutes. Resting is really important because when you pull a protein right off of the heat, whether it's oven or stovetop, the juices are like really rushing around. You know, like heat makes stuff dance. You know, so all those water molecules, they're bouncing around. And if you cut into your chicken right away, all the juices are just gonna run right out. So letting it have a second to just like chill the juices are gonna cool down a little bit, they're gonna slow down, the muscles are gonna reabsorb them, and you're gonna have much more juicy meat. Chicken is rested, now we're gonna carve it. Now all these aromatics, you can eat them, you can save them for broth, toss it into like a frittata. As you can see, my wing is just coming right off. I didn't have to do anything there. When you're carving up a chicken, you're going through the joints, you're not going through any bones, so it should be very, very light pressure. Now for the breast, you can go two ways. If you wanna keep it simple, just go straight through and go through the bone. Or we can just take it off the bone, a little bit easier for your guests to eat. And I'm just gonna kind of pry it open and move the tip of your knife along the bones. The second side is always a little bit harder because you've lost that stability, but you can feel right here where that breastbone is and we're gonna go right alongside it. So sometimes I think it's nice if you're serving more than two people to cut your breast in half so that everyone can have an option of breast. White meat for everybody, you know? I'm gonna eat a wing, because that's my favorite part. The skin's so rendered, you can hear it. Mm-hmm. I love a crispy chicken wing. I love it. You're gonna love it too. You can do this. Leave me alone with my wing. Chicken breast, I know, can have a bad rap. This is gonna be the most flavorful, easy chicken breast 
you've ever had. And the key to that is we're going to slice it up and cook it like a stir fry. If I am gonna have a whole chicken breast, my go-to is a dry brine, always, always. And we already know how to dry brine, so you can figure that out, but you don't always have time for that. So we're gonna make a really quick same day chicken breast that's still flavorful and moist and delicious without a dry brine. Before we get going, once again, we're gonna talk about cross-contamination. So since this is kind of like a stir fry, you need to have all of your mise en place before you get going. Mise en place means having everything in its place. I don't know if that's a direct French translation, but basically it's, it's about like getting everything you need before you get going. Not every recipe requires that you like set up your mise en place. There's a lot of recipes where maybe you have some onions like caramelizing for 30 minutes and you can get that going while you prep everything else. Or maybe there's a few steps that take a little bit longer so you can break up your prep throughout the cook. But for quick cooking, stir fries and fried rice like we did before, frittatas, eggs, things that cook really fast, it's very helpful to have all of your mise ready so you can focus on the fast action that's gonna happen in the pot and not worry about like forgetting anything. So I've prepped a lot of stuff already, but I'm just gonna show you basic knife skill, how to chop onions, super simple. The root end, you often wanna keep intact. Basically, when you cut an onion, you wanna take advantage of the natural shape of the onion to help you. A lot of the knife work's already done for you because onions have layers, as we've learned from Shrek. Huh? Okay. We're gonna start by trimming off the blossom end. We're gonna cut it lengthwise in half, like this. If you have a really dirty root end, it's good to trim that off just a touch so you don't end up with like flecks of that dirt in your onion. And then we're gonna peel. So after you peel, it's good to clean up. Bench scraper is always really handy. I know that it can be tempting to scrape stuff up with the side of your knife, but it isn't the best habit because it does make your blade get dull faster. There's two ways to chop an onion. The way that I learned in culinary school, like the French way, is you go up and down like this and then you come across, and then you go this way. But uh, the onion's already got, it's like kind of already cut for you, so I prefer to go for more of like a, a radial cut. So we're gonna move across the onion like this. It's like we're making tiny wedges, you know, like half an awesome blossom. If you are new to knife work, always make sure that you curl your fingers behind um, if you go like this, it's very easy to like lose a fingernail. So you want to go for this claw situation, and then you can use your knuckles to guide you. We got our little radial cuts, and then we don't have to go horizontally because it's already cut up that way. So you just go this way, and boom, wow, oh my god. It's like a magic trick. We got tiny pieces of onion. Okay, so we've got our onion. And then we're gonna cut up our chicken and we have all of our mise and we can start going. Chicken has a grain, just like every protein. So you wanna cut across the grain. We're gonna slice it this way. If you cut with the grain, that's when you end up with like stringy, tough meat, regardless of how you cook it, just because of the anatomy of the bird. It doesn't need to be perfect in terms of the length of the pieces. As long as the thickness is close, it will all cook relatively quickly. Now, when I get to this fat bit, I personally want the pieces to be kind of bite-sized, so I'm gonna split this in half so we don't have super long pieces. It also just kind of makes the stir-frying bit a little bit faster and easier. Okay, so now that I've got my raw chicken done, I'm gonna get rid of my board, scrub down, wash my hands, and then we're gonna come back and cook. Now we're gonna get cooking. This is called Hara Burg Masala. With a lot of recipes from South Asia, w one dish with one name can have a million variations. Sometimes there's coconut in it. This one has yogurt. We're also kind of making this a shortcut version because this is traditionally like a long braised dish, but we're gonna have all of the same flavors in a quick stir fry version. So we're gonna get this started by heating up a little bit of ghee. So ghee is good for this because it has all of the milk solids removed, so you can heat it up to a higher temp than whole butter. I'm gonna add whole cumin seeds and whole black peppercorn. It's gonna help infuse the ghee with a lot of flavor at this point. Okay, so now I'm gonna add that onion, and this is gonna all cook together until the onions look a little bit translucent. So you can make this in any kind of pot, or if you have a wok, that would be great. We're using a Dutch oven. Um, my favorite tools in the kitchen is a cast iron skillet and a Dutch oven. And I think if you have those two things, you can make anything. 
you don't have to invest in an expensive Dutch oven. You can totally do this with whatever pot you've got. Okay, so you can see my onions. They look translucent. They look tender. They look very different from when they were raw. So now, I'm gonna increase the heat. We're gonna add our grated garlic and ginger, and then our chicken's gonna go in. So I'm gonna just cook this while stirring until the chicken looks opaque and cooked through. And because it's cut in these really thin slices, it's only gonna take like seven to 10 minutes. Dutch oven prices vary dramatically. You can find a $60 American-made Dutch oven or a same size, same looking Dutch oven from France that's $300. And they're all exactly the same. Okay, so get whatever Dutch oven fits in your budget. And more importantly, you can find beautiful Dutch ovens at thrift stores. I do not see a point in buying a new Dutch oven, as long as just check it out, see if the bottom inside is scratched. Who cares if the outside scratched? It's not gonna change the way it works. Okay, so everything is nice and opaque. We're gonna go crank our heat back down to medium and add our salt and chili. Let this cook for just a minute, evenly distribute everything and give that chili a little bit of time to bloom. Now we're gonna add some more chili. Here we've got some diced up green chilies. And we're gonna add about a cup of herbs. We're gonna hold back on a little to finish. That way we get a little bit of this like cooked herb flavor and a little raw herb flavor. I know that a lot of people say you should only use fresh herbs at the end. But that's more of like a European thing. There's a lot of dishes in Persia where you have long cooked stews with fresh herbs and they're absolutely delicious. There's no hard or fast rules in cooking. Our herbs are really nicely wilted. Now we're gonna add our cashew butter and our yogurt. Once this is stirred through, I'm gonna turn off the heat. We don't wanna simmer it too long with the yogurt, but we just wanna get it really nice and warm. And now final finishing touch, we're gonna add the last of our herbs and a little hit of lemon juice. And I'm gonna taste and see if I need any more salt. Mm. All right, so let's plate this up. I personally want just some cucumbers because it's a bit spicy and it'll really cool you off. And we've got a little bit of bread. This will also be good with rice, but you know, choose your adventure here. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you an easy way to prepare the dark meat. Dark meat, unlike white meat, you can cook it a long time. So a braise like this really allows you to break down all of those like connective tissues, all of that fat, because we have this like gentle, moist heat. It's when you take a tougher cut of meat, like dark meat chicken or uh, an active muscle, like a short rib or a pork shoulder, and you cook it in a moist environment, kind of low and slow until everything kind of falls apart and gets really wiggly. The goal with any braise is to like get that collagen to break down. So you end up with this like really silky, unctuous sauce. The difference between a braise and stew basically is just about size. Stew, small chunks, so the whole thing cooks a little bit faster, braise bigger chunks. So today we're gonna make an adobo. It's a Filipino dish and there's a lot of versions of adobo and I think all of them are delicious. The main thing about adobo that's so cool is you take like very few ingredients and you get so much flavor out of it. One of the defining things of adobo is there's always vinegar, oftentimes soy, black pepper and garlic. Those are like the key flavors. This adobo is by Angela de Mayuca, and what's great about it is we're using coconut three ways. So we're gonna have coconut oil, coconut milk, and coconut vinegar. Coconut vinegar is more of like a specialty ingredient. You might have to go to a Filipino store to get it, but it is really, really essential to Filipino cuisine, and I think it's really worth seeking out to make this exactly the way it should be made. And it's a pantry staple that will last a long time, so like, if you take your time and get that bottle, you'll use it. So let's get cooking. So I'm gonna start on medium high heat to melt my coconut oil. Now we're gonna add our whole peppercorns, ground pepper, chili flakes, and whole garlic. We're gonna first toast it lightly and then it's gonna braise for a really long time. So it's gonna get super mellow and sweet. And we're gonna cook this like gently for about five minutes until we get some nice golden color on those garlic cloves and the peppercorns are gonna really toast and the chili flakes are gonna toast. And most importantly, all of those flavors are going to become one with the fat and it's gonna flavor our whole braise. Garlic can be really scary when you see it in this quantity, but remember, 
garlic and onions and all of these kinds of alliums, when you cook them low and slow, they get very sweet. That's also why we're keeping it whole. Garlic is one of these really cool ingredients where depending on how you cut it, the flavor actually changes. You know, you break the cell walls, some stuff happens, but the more broken down your garlic becomes, the more pungent it is. So if you really want like a sweet, mellow garlic, keep it whole. If you really want like the garlic to kick you in the mouth, grate it fine. Fun way to play with your same basic ingredients and get a lot out of it. When you give spices direct heat, that's when they can become like their best self. So I don't ever recommend taking a spice and just like throwing cumin into water. Like if you really want to get the best out of a spice, it's good to like sizzle it in fat first or maybe give it a dry toast so you can really bring the best out of it. I know that spices technically have a shelf life, but I have never thrown a spice out in my life. You might lose some like nuance, but like I'll just like use a little more, take a little bit more time toasting it. These things are really expensive. My mom too, I've never seen her throw out a spice in my life. I think that's controversial. I've seen a lot of people be like, oh, throw it out after six months. Who actually goes into their pantry and thinks about when they last bought cumin? Let's talk about our chicken. So we got drums and thighs. For a lot of recipes, I'd season it with salt right away, but we're gonna have a lot of soy sauce in this, so we're not gonna season this with salt. So we're just gonna pat it dry at this point. So here we got some nice gold in here, and we're gonna start searing. So we're gonna crank up the heat just a touch, and we wanna just get some light browning on the skin side. We're gonna have to do this in batches because there's a bit of chicken, so I'm gonna start with the thighs, move on to the legs. We're not cooking this through at, at all at this point. All we wanna do is render out some of that fat so we don't have like flabby meat. Because this is a moist cooking method, if we don't take the time to do this little bit of rendering, it's not gonna really thoroughly render when it's cooked in like the liquid. This isn't technically a sear because when you wanna sear, you're going for a lot of browning and like a crisp texture. Here, we're just looking to like render the fat and get a little bit of color. So it's okay to do this in a pot with high sides and it's okay to kind of have the pan crowd because we're not going for like crisp because we're gonna add a whole bunch of liquid. Oh, okay, we got browning. If you look at the pot right now, we got a little bit of color, which is just what we want. But most importantly, we have rendered out a good bit of fat. And you are not gonna scoop out and remove any of that fat. It is all staying in the dish. Adobo is really rich and it's like really key to balancing out the vinegar and the soy sauce. That fat is just so incredibly flavorful. So you can see here, you gotta be pretty patient. You don't wanna crank the heat because then you're gonna end up developing a lot of color without actually rendering out the fat. And while the fat's rendering, all of the, the, the garlic and the spices, everything's just becoming more and more aromatic and, and delicious, and we're developing a really nice base of flavor. So th this chicken is okay to go back into this pan with raw chicken, because this chicken is still raw. We got a little bit of color, but it is not cooked through at all. The bottom is still completely raw, and the inside is still completely raw. So you're gonna continue handling this as if it's raw chicken. This is not cross-contamination. And even if this chicken was fully cooked, we're about to simmer it all together for an hour. So there's plenty of time for bacteria to die. So we got a little bit of browning on our drums. I'm gonna add these thighs back in here. All right, so now we're gonna add our soy sauce coconut vinegar, coconut milk, some bay leaves, and water. And I'm gonna let this come up to a boil, and we're gonna cover it, and it's gonna gently simmer for about an hour until everything is really, really nice and tender. So, we've let this simmer for a while, and it's reduced down, and it's like really nice and glossy and saucy. So it's ready to serve. Wow, it looks so good. The color got really nice and deep, and that's because of that soy sauce. Completely just falling apart. Whoa, amazing recipe. You have a lot of richness from the coconut oil and the chicken fat, but it's perfectly balanced by the acidity of the vinegar and the pops of the peppercorn and the sweet garlic. This is gonna go into my regular rotation. It should go into yours too. Okay, so I showed you a bunch of things to do with chicken from scratch, but I think rotisserie chicken 
is an amazing ingredient. I'm gonna show you how to make a really simple chicken soup using your leftover rotisserie chicken. We're gonna start by making a quick broth with whatever you've got. So I'm gonna pick off the rest of this meat so we can have it in our soup. I'm gonna throw the skin into the simmering broth. It's brown, so it's gonna add a lot of nice brown flavor. And I'm gonna pull off the meat and add it to a bowl to add to our soup. Anytime you cook chicken, you should save all the bones. Chicken broth is incredibly expensive, and chicken is really expensive, so I think you should use all of it. So we're gonna use all the bones, any cartilage, skin, wing tips are fantastic, and like get in there and pick off any extra meat. I, I do recommend like anytime you've got not just chicken, but you're cooking anything with bones, just save your bones. Like if you made a ribeye, save that bone. Ribeyes are so freaking expensive. You don't want to let any of that go to waste. You can make a mega broth by mixing all the bones together. I'm actually going to put some of the meat into my broth just to make it a little extra flavorful, especially when you've got like the bits on the wing. I'm going to just throw the whole wing in there. Just sacrifice it to the broth because I think I have enough meat here for my soup. Okay, so we're gonna throw this whole back in here. This is like really fatty and might not be fun to eat, but it's gonna be great in your broth. Our chicken's still a little bit like room temperature, but when you've had this in the fridge for a while, you'll see that like these juices turn into this gel, which is super flavorful, adds a lot of body. You don't wanna waste that. So make sure you scrape all of that in. And if you've got a backbone in the freezer, throw that in here. Now to this, you can also add any like random aromatics you have. You got random herbs wilting, wow. Throw it in there. Got a random half lemon, whoa, crazy. Just a bit of onion, you don't even need to peel. Toss it in there, wow, a bay leaf. Just like, get crazy. I know like, there are technically rules to making the perfect broth, but sometimes you just need broth. And we're gonna just add enough water to cover, and you're just gonna let this simmer until it tastes delicious to you. I like to let it go until the bones completely like fall apart. But if I'm in a rush, maybe I'll just do it for like an hour. All right, so my pot with my bones and my stuff has been simmering for a while. It smells very chickeny in here. And you can see we've got really nice color. The way that you know that your broth is there is, it, first of all, it should taste flavorful. And then you want to see that things are like falling apart. So you can tell like our herbs are totally wilted. The onion is in little bits. We got bones completely broken down. If you taste this chicken, it should be like super dry and bland. That means all the flavors in the liquid and your bone broth is ready to go. How long this takes kind of depends on your chicken and how you've prepared it. With raw bones, it takes quite a while. If you're making this with your own spatchcock chicken, maybe like an hour and a half. Rotisserie chicken, it happens quite quickly. But just like keep an eye on it. If it, your liquid level gets too low, just top it off with water and keep going until it tastes delicious. So now I'm gonna strain this and make a super simple chicken soup, the most basic soup of all. I believe that all of these things have given you all they've got. So I would compost it, maybe pick off some of the meat as a treat for the dogs, but I think this is okay to say goodbye to. We gave our chicken like two lives, which I think is fantastic. Okay, so here we have our broth and you can see it's not like a perfect French clear broth. When you go throughout the globe, it's not clear broth. Like, Think about ramen, think about how cloudy a ramen broth is, but it's so delicious. I don't think that there's like a right or wrong to broth. And now it hasn't had any salt added, so I'm gonna season it up to taste. Because when you're seasoning something like a soup or a broth, you're gonna have to taste it several times to make sure that it tastes good. There's this point where it goes from like, whoa, and you can taste everything really clearly, and that's when you know that you've hit the right amount of salt. But it can be kind of hard to figure it out, and you don't wanna like, risk over salting because then there's no return. That's actually really flavorful. I think it just needs another pinch. It's pretty solid where it's at because we started off with a rotisserie chicken which is already really nicely seasoned. You could boil your noodles separately if you want, but that's like too fussy for me sometimes. So we're gonna boil our noodles right into our seasoned broth. I don't like a lot of noodles. I like my soup to be mostly broth. Ham hates that, he likes his soup to be mostly stuff but it kind of works out because he'll take all the stuff and I'll take all the broth. It's a dream. The other thing that's kind of nice about boiling your noodles in your soup is that it will kind of thicken the broth a little bit if you're into that. If you're not into that, boil your noodles in water separately and then combine. You could go crazy here, add some diced carrot, diced celery. I don't like a lot of vegetables in my soup. 
So I'm just going to add a little bit of onion. Let that boil along with the noodles. You could just add some frozen mixed vegetables here. And once our noodles are tender, I'm just going to finish it off with our picked chicken and a little bit of parsley and pepper, and boom. Okay, so my noodles have cooked, and now I'm gonna turn it down a touch, and we're gonna just add our chicken. It's already cooked, so we just wanna warm it through. I'm gonna finish it with a little parsley and pepper, and for me, this is like, I'm sick chicken soup. The chicken soup I grew up having, the one my mom made, she would put some red lentils and ginger and lime in there. You can flavor this up however you want. I personally really like to keep my sick day chicken soup, very simple. And I know this is not a lot of noodles, but it's how I like it and it's my soup. When you're making your soup, you put all the noodles that your heart desires. So I hope after this episode, you feel like you've conquered chicken, you know? You can do a little bit of butchery, you know what to do with it whole, you know what to do with the dark meat, you know what to do with the white meat, and you know what to do with your leftovers. So go forth, and chicken and stop washing your chicken. <laughs>